the Deaf Festival um, uh, in April. Um, and I think that the collaboration has been very um, successful. Um, and we hope to see more of that in, in the future. I think that's going to be one of the continuing relationships we'll have with Modern, is to um, invite him to play with Joel. Um, and so these are some of the names that Modern kind of um, brought in. And it's, it's sort of a list of people that are very active in the free and pop scene. Um, more, also more younger emerging artists that are um, just constantly gaining and playing around. Um, so that, that was something very um, good for us in that sense. Then I'd like to move to uh, Apollo's projects. Um, Earlier this year, he organized um, the Mobile Music Workshop in um, Amsterdam in collaboration with the, the Black Society. And, <clears throat> and then there was the collaboration with Ben Knapp, who is the developer of Biosignal bio Sensors. And he was the original designer of Apollo's instrument, the Biomuse, uh, which we yeah, are using more signals from the body. Uh, and so this was a good occasion for them to re reconnect after 10 years or something because Ben has worked, uh, he's been developing a new um, sensor. Um, and so this was, um, so they came to Stein on occasions to work together. Also, Tao uh, represented Stein in, in festivals. And now he, when he, when he first came to Stein, he was at the Sony Research Lab in, in Paris. And now he's moved on to Newcastle to start a new department and he's from India. <coughs> One of the biggest um, impacts that the mobile music workshop had was that it was covered by We Make Money Not Art. And um, it was a very big coverage, um, some great write-up on Michelle's presentation. Um, supposedly Michelle got 10 times as many hits on his, on his website and people sent him emails. And I mean, the, the, the conference itself was very, um, very successful. Uh, we had very good responses. And also, we were able to connect with um, some artists like Dylan Harris and also um, Dan Wilcox um, from Sweden, who, who showed their work in the conference and then later came to stand to the residency. <coughs> this is the, the biosensor that Ben Knapp has built. Um, it reads um, EKG signals, so the electricity that um, that travels your muscles when you um, tense your muscles. Um, and the, the big the big breakthrough for this sensor was that the output was zero to five volts, meaning that you could plug it into most sensor interfaces that are available right now. Meaning that it's not really it's not as tied into sort of a custom setup as it used to be that you could buy this for about 200 euros, it's not that cheap, but you could plug it into numerous devices. And it's become more accessible to the wider um, public. That's Ben and Akal working. Not pretending that they're working on the picture. Um, and so Akal also represented um, Stein at numerous festivals, the Five Days Out Festival in the video, the Deaf V2, and the Yama Musica Festival in the Billings. What does that, that, that mean, Yama Musica? Does that mean young music or something? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a music festival dedicated for young composers, and they also have one day a program of inviting organizations from certain countries. So this year was time. Uh, so Atal's new position is at the Culture Lab um, in Newcastle. The Culture Lab is a research center, um, and so and, and in relation to the Culture Lab, they're also building a new uh, digital media uh, master's program. So he's the chair there um, to start up a, a new program, and he's already connecting us with some people at the university, and um, we'll probably see more collaboration through those channels. So then my role is, well, since I, I was based in, the, in, in Amsterdam, and I was the only one that was 
here all the time. A lot of my work went into the coordination of the other artistic directors, um, sort of helping them with their scheduling, helping them with the communication with the other staff at the time. My other role was the curation of the sign concerts and events at uh, the beginning of this year. And then also my, my original position when I came to Stein was as a hardware intern. Um, so I, I still had, um, even though my, my role had, had become lighter with the other um, responsibilities, I still had um, um, some say into the, the research into the hardware. And then also I was able to develop my own, own setup as a performer. Um, so this is one of the things that we started this year is the concert blog. Um, basically documenting all the concerts and writing reviews about the concerts. It's one of the things that we've always been, I think that's always been an issue at Stein is documentation of, of things. Basically we don't have enough resources or um, people to work on that side of the, um, of the projects. So the blog was sort of the perfect way to, to create an archive in a way keep track of all well, the concerts that we do. Um, and so when I was uh, organizing the, the concert series, I had several themes and uh, some of them, one of them was, um, because I'm a turntablist myself, is to organize a turntable evening of inviting experimental turntablists and creating a, a platform for these musicians to show their work. The other one was, um, with my background of being part of the Japanese music scene is to try to introduce Japanese musicians as much as I can and when they're in uh, Europe to try to invite them to Amsterdam. So some of Japanese musicians. So that's Ito Atsuhiro uh, from Japan. I was very happy to get him because he's one of the, one of the new sensations in Japan right now. He plays with the chorus of light. He was so loud that we had to put him in the sound of studio <laughs> over there because he literally shaked the whole building. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, it's sort of a perfect performance. You never really want to share a bell with him because he basically <laughs> erases any memory of whatever he had before that night. Um, <laughs> But he's, 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 a, he's a typical Japanese artist that's pretty well known in Japan, but just doesn't have that many opportunities to travel. And he was invited to be um, to the Venice Biennial this year because I knew about this. I was able to get in contact with him. What's his name? Ito Atsuhiro. The other guy that I was happy to get was Dora Video. Drummer who works with um, video, controlling the video playback with his drums. Uh, so they came on the same night. And again, this other guy that's very popular in Japan right now, but not as much exposed in Japan as right in Europe.
And so there, there's been a lot of debate on that side whether to keep developing um, its unique tools and how much resources to use on it, and also uh, following other Stein traditions of being practical and using what's available to everybody. So yeah, these are some of the, the discussions we have not on the rate of um, So if we're not working on, on a specific platform, building a new platform, then let's look at well, what's, what's the unique sensors that we use here. Um, the ultrasound, the biosignal, full sensors, faders is sort of my own thing. <laughs> but um, so what, what, what if we look at the other end of making modular or usable sensors that plug into other platforms, and we have the knowledge of what what to do after it plugs into the computer. That's that's a lot of things that we do. So maybe we should start focusing on those things. Again, examine what is unique at first time application, accessibility, durability, and play. These are things that are very important issues for the musical applications for performances. Um, so why don't we start looking at those things? <coughs> and then my own personal development. Um, this year for me as a musician has been kind of an amazing year where my um, own musical development has accelerated um, a lot. And a lot of it has to do with sort of the critiques and the exposure that I get to this time. And also the fact that for the first time in my life my, um, my workspace isn't shared with my bedroom. <laughs> that I actually have a studio, uh, that I could use the studios here and have access to the facilities. Um, and that I practice a lot and have faster hands. Um, so here's a performance that, um, that I did last week. And it's, I mean, a lot of people told me that they really like the performance, but even in my view, if I compare this to a concert that I did a year, exactly a year before this, there's been just such a, a huge progression in, um, in terms of what I wanted to do and what I wanted to achieve musically. Um, so. uh, other directions in development. So we started looking at the Wii controller uh, for its accessibility, its, its cheapness. Everybody is sort of familiar with it. It's a great prototyping tool. Second Life is another development that took place uh, with some members of, of Stein. There was a test lab uh, presentation of Michelle Michel Weisowitz's instrument that he built in Second Life. Um, so we're creating environments in that. So to wrap up things, so that this model will work out and we'll be getting along. <laughs> 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 Actually, we got along very well, uh, despite all of our um, different backgrounds. There was also uh, not too much interaction. Actually, we, we met at the very beginning, talked about it, but throughout the year, um, each artistic director came. Or the, what they came at different times, to had their projects. Um, so there was a good balance between the personal projects, uh, their personal research and public organizational projects, like the conferences or the concerts. Um, it was good for Stan because there's more representatives to travel around the world to show the work. Um, and also they, they work as important mediators uh, for collaboration with other institutions because we're sort of rooted and we don't have special attachments that we fear. It's much more easy for us to go to other institutions and act as somebody in between. And, um, I think that's, that's, uh, that's something very good for Stein. Um, some difficulties was, of course, the communication between the remote location, time zones, um, meeting with their expectations, and sort of shaping their projects. And yeah, respecting each of their backgrounds, sort of understanding where they come from, and trying to give them um, a, sort of a promise uh, character to their projects. Um, was sort of some issues that um, uh, we dealt with. And so the ending was, was yesterday. We had a concert uh, with a selected curation of the year. So each artistic director um, invited a performer. Uh, it was a very diverse night. 
So I want to tell you a little bit about the projects that have been going on here at Stein the last year. Um, projects are kind of my responsibility, I see it. Um, projects come in all the time, project applications that is. Um, together with, uh, with Taku and Michelle, Frank and Daniel Schorno, um, we sit together about once every month to go through new applications and make a selection because unfortunately we cannot support all all of them, so we have to make a selection. Um, we're also always trying to incorporate the, the, the other artistic co-directors. Uh, usually that's done through email. Um, our, all our project applications are online. Of course, password protected, but they can actually go there and, and read them. Uh, so we can actually ask them their opinion about it, which, which really helps because they have another uh, look on it, of course, and maybe sometimes they know the people who um, applied Sometimes actually people apply because uh, one of them actually um, promoted, asked them actually to apply because they thought it was interesting. Um, so there's a couple of different projects we kind of uh, divide them in. Um, the first one is the most like easy step in for projects is orientation workshops. Um, those are usually people who are who apply for a project that is not really mature yet or still in development, people who are really exploring the possibilities. Um, we usually advise them to, uh, to, to do an orientation workshop. We did six of them this year. Uh, the orientation workshop is about a week um, with usually four to five people. Um, we organize sessions by time staff, so Taak is actually showing his setup and talking about the artistic direction of time. I'm showing them the Lisa software, the Junction software, Frank is also involved. Um, so we try to really um, show them all the different uh, tools Stein has to offer and the ways that people can interact with Stein. Um, and usually at the end we talk to them about maybe a next step and maybe that, that will wait for a longer time. Maybe they really have a specific idea and the next the real project can start pretty soon after that. Um, other projects, actually the other side of the spectrum is studio only, which is usually people who are rehearsing for something, they're developing a piece without too much sign in, uh, like, uh, too much sign influence in a way that we don't, we, we, we see what they're, what they're doing, they sometimes do a presentation, and we're not really involved very deeply. Um, <coughs> This, we see this as a good way to make use of the studios because otherwise studios would be empty and that's of course a shame. Um, Stein is not big enough to really support projects that go on all the time in all the studios. So for us this is a way to make use of the studio and also meet interesting people that maybe we can get involved if that happens to work out. Um, the third section is uh, R&D residency. I labeled it. Um, it's, it's something between orientation and studio only. Uh, it's where people have a, a much specific, more specific idea of what they want to do. It's usually hardware or software related where they want to develop something. Um, and they come to time for one or two weeks, uh, work on this with uh, the hardware guys and uh, with Frank or um, 
sometimes also just working on it themselves again, a lot of feedback from, from us. Um, those usually take more take more time to actually support, so that's why we don't do set so many of them. Um, that's also pretty hard to actually select, I think. Um, and then there's advice or walk-ins or whatever, there's people who actually come in and or actually want some feedback on their project, but they live in the neighborhood or they happen to come by. Um, or it's a project that we think might be interesting, but we want to talk to them first. Then we might invite people for a, a meeting. They just talk to them with a couple of people. Um, also, under this, this section, I, I find the, the, the projects that, that need like um, a little soldering, for example, or a little bit of help with the laser setup. People will just come in for one or two hours. Um, and our, <coughs> our Frank or, or Taku or Jorgen, the instrument maker, um, with some small things. That, that happens quite regularly also. It's usually, of course, people we know already, and it's usually people who are uh, local, but um, this is also a really useful uh, uh, feature, I think, in our useful kind of project. Um, same time as the concert blog, we also created a project blog. Uh, it works a little bit different because we actually ask people after each project to um, submit an entry on the project log. So that way, actually, uh, we build up kind of a documentation of the projects and people actually enter it themselves and we add it a little bit or we kind of uh, um, make sure that the format is, is okay and, and things. But it's, uh, it's pretty open. Um, and I think it's, it's now slowly growing. It's quite difficult to get people to enter something because sometimes they think it's not really worth entering, or, um, but slowly it's actually becoming like a, like a common thing, so more and more people do this. Um, the next slide is uh, a little big. <laughs> I'm not going to read it all, I'm not going to ask you to read it all. But I actually, I took the opportunity when Taco asked me to present the projects, to actually go through our projects from this year, um, make a list of them, and try to get some data out of it. Um, originally, I'm a mathematician. I, <laughs> I hate the statistics. I'm going to say I hate the statistics, so it's not really my... Uh, and it's hard already, of course, if you do something like this, you see I try to actually um, identify a type of support and the field of residency, which is... It doesn't work, but I try to work it. Um, because you have to kind of label people, of course, mm -hmm. put a stamp on their heads. But. Um, so I made this list, it's uh, per month. Um, what is quite interesting, actually, I, I, the country of residence I put in this column. Uh, so this is the country of residence, which means also known Dutch people who live here or are local. I count it as Dutch to be able to see where people come from generally, like where people travel from when they come this time. Um, the number of days, and then, uh, yeah, I just, like I said, I tried to categorize them. Um, what you see actually kind of interesting, in January there's a lot of studio-only projects. <coughs> By the way, this is also, studio-only doesn't mean that we don't have any involvement at all. There's, of course, projects that fall like, between the types. <coughs> um, but usually January is also quite quiet. It's not, people are still on holidays from, from maybe from the... From, after Christmas, um, it tends to be quite a period anyway. So, um, if you scroll down a bit, then you see that April and May is actually pretty big. Um, and we start to see some R&D residencies here. Of course, the orientation column, they're kind of grouped because we have, we have groups of people at the same time, like I explained. Um, then June and July is pretty quiet, because July officially very closed, so this actually should be uh, empty, but we still allow people to actually do some studio <coughs> things, and actually there was some, uh, some involvement of time also. Um, I'll just scroll by, if you have any questions about specific things, I'll, after this slide I'll go to some specific projects I think are kind of um, characteristic, so if you have questions about any of these, you see them. Um, and then, of course, September, October starts again. Um, and in the end, there's some numbers, the numbers I hate. Uh, so 
So the average number of days that people stay is 8.6, <laughs> which is uh, kind of interesting. Uh, we usually try, like, usually res residencies are one to two weeks. If people come from far, we usually tend to give them a longer period because they have to travel so far. But sometimes also people stay just two days. Or, um, so um, there's a type of support. You see, studio only is pretty big, which was to, expect, to be expected, kind of. Uh, orientation is also pretty big. We did six orientation workshops, which they tend to grow also in number and in number of people at the same time. Um, and then here's the more difficult part. I identified mainly musicians and composers. Um, but of course, as people, most people actually don't fit into one category. Uh, also, the one idea was like theater of visual arts. And actually, my next plan was to go through the previous year for the same and see what the differences were, but it was quite a lot of work, so <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe next time. But the interesting thing also is that um, there were actually uh, 107 projects that I had identified here. And I have to say that uh, all the advice projects, people that just walk in or have a meeting for an hour, are not on this list. So, because they're not in our planning, and it's data that we actually will actually get in January because then we will have to write our annual report with that data. So people have to come up, like Frank is, is asked to actually make a list. Like, who did you talk to? And me also. And, yeah. So all the projects that actually occupy space, there were 40 of them which were local, so to say, which is pretty big because we expected actually to think of it, but that's mainly because a lot of local people are not Dutch, so it was always our idea that we support not so many Dutch people, which in a way is correct, but you know, we support quite a lot of local projects, which is, is also good, I think. Um, yeah, so that's some of the numbers. specific projects. Um, actually, I just went through this list we just saw, and I also went through the recent <coughs> project applications that are going to happen next year. So uh, some of them are on here. Um, the first one is an example of an orientation workshop. It was actually a small one with uh, Tony De Lange, uh, player, Alex Novich, a voice uh, a singer, a voice artist, um, and Sabina Vogel, who plays the flute. Um, it was a small group. Alex and Sabina are actually a couple, so it was kind of a, a weird group with like, yeah, three people which two know each other pretty good. But actually, they started to, uh, to work together in the studio and they really recorded stuff, and I think they're still in touch, uh, like, yeah, trying to make some recordings. And actually, uh, Tony also added uh, a project blog entry, which is here. Um, you can actually go to the project blog through our, the homepage of our website uh, and just scroll through them. Um, yeah, you see some pictures here of them, Alex and Sabina working in the studio. The next one is uh, Taco mentioned already, Dan Wilcox. He was actually uh, uh, somebody who did a demo at the uh, Boa Music Workshop. Um, and there we actually got in touch with him and we invited him to do a project here. And it turned out in the, well, so I labeled it R&D Residency. Uh, he was pretty self sufficient. He like, does all the programming and the computer building himself. So we weren't really very much in touch, but of course we kept an eye on what he was doing. And, uh, we also added a blog entry, which you can see here. Um, when I read this application first, I actually was involved in the selection of projects for the Global Music Workshop. Um, I found it really interesting and funny also, the way he worked with it. Um, his music is quite typical. I think you either love it or you hate it. Um, but I thought he was a very, yeah, very unique mind in a way. <coughs> Basically, he, uh, he built a Linux, Linux computer, uh, as small as possible, so he could actually wear it uh, on his body, uh, together with just a MIDI guitar, 
and some buttons and some knobs to actually control the music. Um, and as time, you want to do, yeah, re review some of the interfaces, um, and change some of those. Um, we also set some initial goals and actually the revised goals. Um, it's quite interesting that he started out with an Arduino board to add some buttons, but in the end, uh, he didn't find it reliable enough, so he basically just uh, hacked the joystick, um, which he put in this button box. Not all very high tech in a way, but very interesting as a, as a concept, I think. Um, and this is all run by pure data on this Linux computer. Um, as you can see, he does, well, you probably can't see, but he made a sequencer in, in PD, so it's, really, it's, it's quite rhythmically based what he does, which is not so much lifetime usually, but it was, uh, yeah, like I said, an interesting project. And you see his guitar with uh, actually the, the Wii mode he built in. Um, it's a pretty big mess. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. Phil Stearns. Um, he was part of a group of uh, PhD students from Colorado in California. Um, this is actually the first group of uh, collaboration we, we hope to uh, continue. Uh, he was one of <coughs> four people from Colorado that actually came to Stein and worked on their own projects, getting feedback from Stein people, uh, getting some support in software and uh, figuring out software. Uh, but I think he struck us as a very specific, very interesting project. He created this, uh, this neural network, this analog, artificial neural network. Uh, this thing here, it's actually, he calls it, he names it a she somewhere, I think. It's quite interesting. Um, it consists of actually uh, about 50 of the same uh, analog neurons that he connects in a way where on this side you can actually uh, there's some light sensors that detect light. Uh, there's, I think these are the two microphones, uh, the ears, that actually pick up sound. And at the end there's actually a, a small speaker that generates sounds. Um, and the idea is he has all these neurons that are the same. Um, well, you have to read it to go into the details, but I think somewhere he writes they all, all these neurons, these small objects, yeah. Okay. Wow. Um, they all have input, output, and uh, a small part that does some processing of the data. Um, and actually, on the end, there's a, you see some of the, these are actually this is this army of the neurons. It's actually amazing also as a, as, a, as a sculpture kind of idea because they were really small sculptures and he then puts together one big sculpture. It's all open frame and electronics. Yeah. There's yeah. no circuit board. It's all yeah. no. circuit board. It's no. free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't find, there's a link somewhere with some sounds, but I have only five minutes left. So <laughs> but this is all, you can all see this on the project blog, so I advise you to go. Um, I think I have to skip some. Uh, Tom Talim actually uh, played yesterday also. He did an interesting uh, project with. Um, I'm sure anyway. Um, the inspiration for this project actually started with um, a photographer. Her name is Shira Krasman. And she actually makes pictures like, like, like she, has, she has an animal camera with a film. She just pulls the film slowly through uh, while keeping the shutter open. So you get these, these images. Actually, the, the subject also moves, but also the image moves. Um, and to me, also, immediately, I get reminded of, the, of these FFT analysis images of audio. Um, and he actually took, so Tom actually took um, recorder sounds and actually stretched them, kind of froze them. Um, and actually put them together with some written score, written score for the recorder. And uh, I didn't hear the piece, but some people did. I think Taco saw it when he heard it, and got really good reviews of those. Then, so. and I think this is the initial part. So I hope he's going to go on and uh, we'll see a little more later. Um, 
Okay, this one I want to show, Nick Fox Geek. He's also really self-sufficient. He's actually an animator, a visual artist, who, work with, who works with sound also. Um, and this small residence he was looking for uh, make, to make color organs, which are kind of like your iTunes visualization thing, but then a little more interesting, I think. Um, using Isadora, uh, and Jitter, and PD, actually. Um, basically doing small tests, like this one. Usually he laughs a lot, like he, if you see him, he's always smiling, and now you see this picture, and he's like very serious. But it's basically, it's basically small like exercises, I've seen them as exercises, but uh, I think they're really interesting. He also makes really interesting animation and also commercials, commercial stuff. Um, and I think that the last one I'm going to show is Corey Vogel. He did an orientation workshop just a couple of weeks ago. He's a drummer. And he works in uh, installation environments. Um, we actually want to incorporate some electronics, but not by making extra gestures, but using the gestures of his body while playing the drums. And I think it was really searching, and I, th I think he's still kind of yeah trying to digest this new information and see what he, was, what he can come up with. But what triggered us actually, or triggered me, what I found really interesting is, uh, for example, this. Uh, this uh, installation, or this conference where you're sitting somewhere in the middle of the space. <laughs> because he was telling me when well, it was here, it was already cold, and he was knitting uh, a scarf. <laughs> <laughs> and actually another one is... Um, <coughs> yeah, I should have preloaded those. These are probably over my five minutes. So we know what you want to learn, and you learn that, and that's it. 
Um, Mediamatic has some more interesting uh, ideas about workshops where you can still teach this kind of stuff, but in a more uh, in, in a more in a context where you actually have a certain goal to um, yeah to develop something. And I'll tell you why. Um, the mobile music workshop. We had this new interface for performance workshop, which is a continuing thing. Um, and then we've done some traveling, uh, doing workshops and concerts at uh, Brown University of Rhode Island in Edinburgh recently. And Frank did a workshop with Daniel and, and Jorgen, the instrument maker in uh, Paris recently. Okay, that's it. If you have any questions, I'll be around later. Thank you. Thank you. Objects where just you know, people who walked in or play with, and we call that the touch exhibition. This uh, thing was quite successful, but um, there was a little disadvantage, and that was that all the objects were physically big. Actually, that was very nice, but the problem was that when we moved to a location where they would want us, we moved to rent a big van. And so the amount of money involved in just transporting all the stuff and building up and so on was uh, well, a lot. And we noticed uh, at a certain moment that uh, organizations were less and less willing to pay that amount of money just to set up something. So a couple of years ago, um, Michelle and I came up with the idea to make everything much more mobile. And what we have ended up with now is an exhibition which consists an average of eight to ten musical objects, which fits in one trolley. So we can even step on the plane with it. And instead of a team of five to six people building up and so on, basically this is grown now by me and uh, Austin Linskens, who is also my partner. And uh, so we travel together, we set up the stuff, and we sometimes we do little guided tours. Um, we maintain the whole stuff. And that's how we work now. So what I want to show you is a brief overview of where we have been with the exhibition this year. This year was quite successful because we have got a lot of invitations. So as you can see, we have been in uh, six different locations. Uh, actually, uh, I think at the beginning of the year, there was a very short sort of demo period where it was set up at STEM. Uh, that's a thing. Usually, the exhibition is only visible at the location where we are invited. And a lot of people ask, well, why is it not here at Stein? Because although it fits in a small trolley, when everything is uh, you know, exhibited, you preferably need this whole space. And since space is uh, scarce, you might say, uh, we keep it in the trolley. So the first one was a quite long event. This was in Paris, in Mendoza, and we were invited by Labs, which is an organization uh, who was just starting up, doing all kinds of stuff in uh, electronic music, uh, exhibition work, uh, workshops, and so on. So we did a sort of a whole package over there, and uh, we were there for two weeks, and to be honest, um, uh, especially in the beginning, it was very disappointing because uh, we had put a lot of effort in, in putting everything there and there was no public. People didn't show up and uh, publicity was something that they had tried to do the best that they could. But Mendoza, uh, if you don't know it, it's really outside of Paris. And, um, so it's not a typically a location where just people walk in just to see, oh, what's happening here. You have to know about it. Luckily, the second week, um, there were guided to the school tours. 
And then it became really nice because the schools came by and uh, we did, we did a, a, as I said, a guided tour with them. And at the end of that uh, week, uh, Michel also did some uh, workshops uh, with the children where he played with his instrument and they could play with the sounds. And uh, as a sort of close off of this whole festival, uh, we had some concerts. I just want to show you a few pictures. So this is how the space looked like. Usually uh, the exhibition space is quite dark, where we have little lights uh, to focus on the musical objects. And so here you see some children playing with the whole thing. This object is called the headbanger. Uh, a very popular finger web. And here is Michelle grabbing the sounds of the kids and playing with them in workshops. <laughs> and as you can see, uh, little children, uh, adults, I mean, basically everybody loves it. Um, so, all in all, it was a nice time over there, which could have been, I think, much more visited if publicity had been better. Then, quite shortly after that, uh, Astrid and I went to Lille. And there they had arranged publicity a little bit better. Because in two weeks, in, we actually we were there for three days, and there was one day which was guided school tours, and that was done quite well. And then in the weekend, it was just open to the public. And in these two days in the weekend, we got more than 1,000 visitors. And it was so full that this was a space, it was a sort of a corridor, that at one point you could come in, and the other point you could go out. So they had people from the opera just holding people. Like, now it's full, you cannot come in. And then at a certain moment, they will get a signal from the other end low. Some people have left, now you can let new people in. And that's nice, of course. That's what you want. Yeah? Lots of visitors. And the th what was nice here is that it was really also good, uh, I would say, a uh, directive. Because if you get too many people, it just becomes a big uh, noise thing. <clears throat> and uh, then people don't hear anymore what they are doing. So I think uh, this is a nice situation. And so here again there was a mixture of adults with children. All right. Then, beginning, well, actually in the middle of the summer, we went to Croatia in Rijeka, and that, this was a festival where there was a lot of Dutch stuff coming on. The original idea was that, uh, besides the exhibition. We would do workshops and concerts over there, but as usual, uh, money became an issue. So uh, they didn't have enough money uh, for hiring all this stuff, and they decided that they wanted to have the exhibition. So I said, and I went there, and we set it up for one week. And it was what was nice is uh, this space where we were was actually a sort of gallery and was in a very busy street. And uh, so in this case, we decided to leave light in instead of <coughs> keeping everything dark so people could look inside what is there. So this is just uh, the window and everything inside. And here you can see it <laughs> guarded quite well. And uh, this actually worked. I mean, people started indeed, they walked by and so, said, hey, something is happening there. And it was open, free for the public. A couple of hours uh, every day it was not even full time open. And this is the official opening. And at a certain moment, uh, Austin decided to do a new experiment and to take some of the, or one of the objects outside. And one of the all time favorites in the exhibition is the crackle box. So she came, she, she did go outside with the crackle box together with a Croatian guide, because normally for the exhibition we always ask for guides at the location. 
And the advantage in this case, of course, is that this woman spoke Croatian perfectly. And I can tell you, Croatian is a very different language. So they started, you know, playing a bit. People got curious, and then people would be invited inside uh, the space. And did, we did this for one hour, and we got in this hour 100 visitors. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we definitely want to do more. <laughs> of course, it doesn't make much sense if you're somewhere in a very outside area where nobody walks by, but in a busy street like that. And for the front of McDonald's. <laughs> I mean, lots of people there. So here again, children playing. Um, crackle box where we can touch each other. You can also make sounds. Then in September, end of September, we were invited back in Cork, in Ireland. And uh, so this was the second time last year we had been there as well. And they liked it so much, they wanted us back. And actually this year was even a bigger success and they want us back next year as well. And what happens a lot of times is that these dates we get for the exhibition usually are a sort of deadline for Michelle and me to think of a new object. And so uh, most of the time what we try to do is for every exhibition we try to think of one or preferably two new objects or make some changes to existing objects to make them more interesting. And uh, here what I liked about it is it was in a theater and we were set up on a stage. So you had a really nice theater light and you can get this very how do you say that, uh, concentrated uh, cell. And, yeah, lots of people walked in, playing with it. Then we went to Orsmere in Ghent. And this was an example of how we should not do it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Orsmeer is a Belgian organization who is uh, quite successful in organizing events. Uh, they, there's always a lot of people are coming to it. And the Vooruit is a really nice theater in Kent. And uh, there was a whole lot of festivities going on there, theater pieces and so on, lots of stuff. And we were put in a space where we were in front of a, a theater hall. And it was just for four hours. And in these four hours, we got about 500 visitors, which is too much if the space is half the size of this room. So that's, I mean, it was way too crowded. And one thing that we learned from this is that if you get such a huge amount of people, then first of all, you need a much bigger space, and because otherwise people won't be able to hear the individual objects anymore, and you need many more guides. Uh, this is about the average how it looked like this room. And at a certain moment, this was also very interesting. Usually the objects are fine. I mean, everything is running from a, a, a limited set of computers, and they're all, all the sensors and so on are all connected to those machines, and everything basically always works. But at a certain moment, half of the installations shut down. <laughs> and I was like, what is that? And then I started looking, and under a table, I discovered a little kid who has found the master on off switch. <laughs> <laughs> of course, this always happens when it's really busy. <laughs> and then the other problem is that when you switch it on, you should not touch the stuff for about a minute. Try that when there are about 50 people. You know. So, as I said, we don't touch that. Was it afternoon or was it for a theater or uh, you know, theater evening? It was uh, in the afternoon. And uh, so uh, right after this, we drove back home and the next morning we flew to uh, Edinburgh. Okay. Here. And in Edinburgh, they, we were invited by uh, a university. There was a guy over there, his name was Paul Keane, who was basically a student. 
And at one, he was studying uh, media, art, and music. And at a certain moment, he found hanging uh, on a, how do you an announcement board, a little booklet, which he showed it to me, it was still hanging there, was a brochure stamp released 15 years ago. <laughs> And he was so excited about reading all this stuff, he thought, I should get these people here. And purely on his own initiative, he started getting in contact with us. And um, in the end, really only in the end, he also got the people from the university, like the teachers and so on, to be you know, like, uh, supportive. And uh, in the end, he was able to get us over. And it was, I think it was fantastic. Uh, we did uh, um, what we call expert workshops. Daniel and I did a workshop with Lisa and Junction. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a, a concert where Taku played. Uh, Taku and I also had talks with the uh, participants of the workshops about their ideas. Uh, the idea now is that um, a, a number of these people will probably next year come to Stein to do a orientation workshop. Uh, of course, we had the exhibition where also a school was invited. This was very successful, and the result of this is that they they want us back for a science festival, which is organized by the university, in April of next year. And they wanted to be a much bigger event with lots of especially guided school tours, because what I heard afterwards that uh, that was very very successful. Which is always nice to hear. So, a couple of pictures of the kids, and here we have. Oops. Hey. Missing the slide. Mm -hmm. ah. This is. Uh, I, I have a few, few pictures of the objects for those of you who haven't seen it. Uh, this is called the sound shaker. Uh, broken, by the way, again, so we had to replace it with a new one. <coughs> uh, this is one of the all-time favorites, the finger web, an instrument where you can make music without having ever played a musical instrument before, but just touching and grabbing and feeling. Um, this is the voice scratcher. You speak something to the microphone and then you start moving those little Actually, they are curtain stoppers. <laughs> <laughs> Modified curtain stoppers. And I'm sorry, who uh, would stand here as a late. So the, the ultrasound sensors and the distance determines which part of your recording you're listening to. <coughs> For us in the scene, you might see is quite normal. But most people have never heard that before, so they're always very excited about it. What do you call this? The uh, voice scratcher. This is the uh, uh, the music uh, treasure box, mm -hmm. and uh, as you can see, two little boxes. And when you open them, you will hear music, but it doesn't play right. And the idea is that you try to find the proper combination of opening the lid in such a way that it plays normally. And inside the boxes are light sensors. So they just detect how many how much light is coming in. It's very simple, but it works really well. And we have another set which we call the uh, uh, sound pressures. And then when you open the box, you hear all kinds of weird um, human voices coming out, mm -hmm. which is me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, uh, cracker box and the headbanger. <laughs> And the headbanger is, an, is another interesting, I would say, almost typical STEM example. It's a set of headphones with a little box on top of it. Inside the box, there is a, the electronics of a, a gamepad. This gamepad, the graphics destroyer toolpad, uh, is not an ordinary gamepad. It has a tilt sensor. And uh, what is nice is that uh, um, I just took out the electronics, put it inside that box, 
And then, of course, the, uh, the, the game controller is connected to the junction software. And that translates this information into uh, MIDI information to control our other software called Lisa. So you put on the headphones, dance music starts to happen, and then when you start doing this quicker and quicker, the music starts speeding up by making these kind of movements, or changing filters, and so on and so on. And so, also really successful. The only problem I had was finding a set of headphones which was big enough to put this box on top of it. And this is one of our latest ones, which is, uh, seems very simple. Um, and to be honest, I completely forgot its name right now. But the idea is based upon feedback. It's a tiny microphone, this actually. So when you hold it near the speakers, you get a strange kind of feedback happening. And you can move it around, and the sound changes. And uh, I think it's really nice. That was the last picture. Okay, now I want to talk for a few more minutes also about the software development. Um, as you can understand, uh, I had to spend uh, also quite some time on this kind of stuff, uh, making new objects and so on and so on. And uh, besides that, I do, uh, of course, the software development. And the main work on software this year has been on junction. And uh, I'm not going to explain what junction completely is, because that takes um, too much time. But the idea of junction is that we can use any kind of outside world uh, sensor or whatever, uh, connect that to your computer and translate that information into MIDI information to control music applications or devices. Junction uh, is now in version 3.2, and this year, uh, you might say, we upgraded uh, in the beginning of this year from version 2.6 to version 3. And starting from, uh, what was it, September last year, uh, I had the help of a, a woman who was studying, who was studying at the University of uh, Aachen. Germany, Saskia Deibach, and uh, she has done a lot of work also in Junction. Uh, first of all, she helped me changing the, the file format, because I wanted to have my file format uh, e more easily readable. It's now all XML files. And uh, the other big thing that she did was support for this nice controller called the Wii Remote. And uh, I just want to sort of handle a, a little example of um, how you use it. So what I'll do is I'll start up junction. And I will connect junction to um, a program that sits on every Macintosh garage band. <laughs> and I'm not using garage band just as a sequencer. I am going to use garage band as a synthesizer. 